So today we're starting with chapter 13 and we are looking at the only mental disorder we're going to pay, pay a lot of attention to in outcome two, which is specific phobia. So we're going to look at what specific phobia is and we're going to apply our biopsychosocial approach to that. So we're going to apply the biopsychosocial approach in terms of firstly looking at the factors. So what are the biological, psychological and social contributing factors that basically uh, lead people or cause people to develop specific phobia in the first place. And then we're going to look at the biological, psychological and social based um, evidence based interventions or treatments or strategies that can be used for someone with a specific phobia to better control their symptoms of anxiety and better control their mental condition there. So that's basically um, the focus of this chapter. So we start off by looking at um, introducing what stress is, what anxiety is, and how stress and anxiety are related to specific phobia. And in this spread, we're going to basically be um, comparing what is normal stress and anxiety versus the kind of stress and anxiety that people with specific phobia experience. So if we think about specific phobia, you know, when we look at mental disorders, if you remember last year as well, when we did mental disorders, we learned that there are different types of mental disorders. For example, um, the most common mental disorder most of us know is depression. Okay, depression is an example of a mood disorder. Um, other examples of like schizophrenia, for example, schizophrenia is an example of a psychotic mental disorder. Um, so similarly, specific phobia is an example of an anxiety disorder. That's how we classify this mental disorder, okay? And we call specific phobia as an anxiety disorder because along with stress, um, one of specific phobia's main symptoms that the patients who have it experience is anxiety, okay? Anxiety is a key um, symptom or key effect that the person who has specific phobia experiences every single time they encounter or come close to encountering the phobic stimulus. And I'm going to be referring to this word phobic stimulus a lot, but phobic stimulus just means the thing that you're scared of. Okay. It could be an object. It could be an event. It could be a situation. It could be a person. It's basically the thing that makes you feel that phobic response or makes you experience that extreme fear response there. And we know from unit three, we've already learned about the definition of stress in unit three. It's the same thing that we're looking at here, okay? It's a state of physiological and psychological arousal, and it's produced by either internal or external stresses, okay? And usually when we're stressed, it means that we feel like that thing that's stressing us or the stressor is challenging our ability or it's exceeding our ability to cope or it's exceeding our resources to cope. So either we don't feel like we can cope with it ourselves, or we don't feel like we have the resources. For example, we don't have enough money to cope with that particular um, stressor, okay? In terms of the definition for stress, look, in the SAC, we're not gonna ask you to define stress, but it's important for you to recap this definition from unit three, because you need to understand that people who experience specific phobia experience this symptom as well. Okay, along with the normal anxiety. So what is anxiety? We've never looked at the anxiety definition before. Anxiety is a state of physiological arousal. It's associated with feelings of being uncertain, feelings of worrying, feelings of unease. You feel uneasy, you feel uncomfortable. And something that in you feel those experiences or you feel those negative feelings there because you feel that something is wrong or that something unpleasant will happen. The key idea being will happen. It hasn't really happened, but you're worrying in advance. That's the difference between um, anxiety and stress. Okay, so with anxiety, we're worrying about something that hasn't happened yet, but we're just, um, you know, we're basically getting all kind of flustered up about something that hasn't happened yet. With stress, something has happened. For example, someone has crashed their car or someone has gotten into an argument with their friend and that's causing them stress. If you're anxious or you're uncertain or you're worried that, you are going to get into an argument with your friend or you don't want to drive your car because you're scared you're going to crash it, but you haven't, those things haven't occurred yet. That falls under anxiety. Okay. And anxiety is what people with specific phobia experience because if you're, for example, scared of dogs and you, you know, want to go outside for a walk, you may not go on your walk or you may prevent yourself from having that daily exercise because you're scared that a dog will come up and bite you or that a dog might chase you down the street okay those things haven't happened but it's that um it's that premonition that it's going to happen that makes you um get all kind of worked up okay that's anxiety for you there 
So really important to know the difference between stress and anxiety. Okay, so we can actually um, represent stress and anxiety on our mental health continuum that we looked at, you know, in chapter 11. Okay, when we look at our mental health continuum, remember there are three mental health states. So we've got mentally healthy on one extreme, mental disorder on the other extreme, and mental health problem right in the middle. Now, generally with mental health problem, we say that mental health problems start to arise when we start to experience increased anxiety and increased stress. Not to the level that it's causing us to dysfunction just yet, but to the level where it is starting to um, wreak havoc on our mental health. We're not feeling, you know, problem free. We're not feeling, um, you know, like we can cope. So we're starting to move from a state of mentally healthy to a state of mental health problem. And you can see that as we start to move on this continuum from a state of being mentally healthy, we start to approach increased anxiety and stress, okay? Um, and this is basically still in this area here, okay? When anxiety and stress get to a level where it gets so high, where you're always experiencing anxiety every single day, okay, and it's going up, both of them are going up, so the stress is going up, anxiety is going up, this increases the chance for a lot of mental disorders, okay? Could be depression, could be, um, you know, specific phobia, could be bipolar, but Anxiety going up a lot in conjunction to stress in our context for this chapter usually leads to increased chances of you developing specific phobia, or we would say an increased susceptibility to developing this mental disorder, okay, if we're trying to use those words that we learned in chapter 12. So susceptibility, can't write with this thing. Okay, so remember that this is the continuum. No one starts with a mental health disorder. It builds up until it gets to this point. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And remember that just because I've got a specific phobia, it doesn't mean I'm stuck here forever. I might go through the treatments that we're going to learn about in spread 12C. And I might, you know, work through it with my psychologist or my therapist. And I might be able to go back to a state of mental, um, mentally healthy. Okay, and that's the main purpose of the continuum that... Um, we can move between the mental health states, that we're never stuck in one state, that our mental health state is never, can anyone remember the word? It starts with the letter S and it rhymes with automatic. Static. Good, static, yes. And her mental health state is never static, okay? It's always moving, it's always changing there. So that's important for you guys to know and always important or always good to always link back to your uh, mental health continuum there. Okay, so now we're going to look at what are normal experiences of anxiety and what are not normal or what are kind of um, anxiety like someone with specific phobia would experience. So a normal experience of anxiety would be feeling anxious when you're flying through turbulence. So you know when you're on a plane and it feels, feels like ages ago, but you know when we used to go on planes and um, there'd be turbulence in the air and the plane would kind of shake or there'd be a storm outside, so it'd kind of feel like unsteady. That's a normal experience of anxiety because there's actually something happening outside that's causing the plane to shake and you can feel that that's actually something happening outside, okay? You're not worrying for no reason there. You're not becoming worked up for no reason. You have a good reason, okay? So if you experience anxiety here, this is completely normal, okay? Um, if you experience butterflies when, you know, you've gone up to, for example, the top of Eureka Tower and you're sitting in that kind of glass box or whatever, um, and then you're looking down and you start to get butterflies in your stomach, that's also kind of normal, okay? Obviously, you're right at the top of a skyscraper. You have all the reason to feel that anxiety. It's not like you're feeling anxiety just, you know, looking up from, you know, the bottom of the street. You are at the top, Okay, when you get nervous, when you see a pit bull or rottweiler who's kind of snarling at you or viciously kind of um, barking at you, that's also normal because the rottweiler is right in front of you and that is what would appear to be like a threat, okay? So that is normal for you to feel anxious in that situation. You have a reason, in other words. Okay, and the last one, feeling a little queasy when getting a, a shot or when your blood is being drawn. So if you've, um, you know, if you're going to get the vaccine done, for example, um, and you know, you're not really stressed, but the minute you approach that kind of vaccination center or clinic, you start to get a little bit queasy in your stomach. You start to get a little bit anxious for no reason at all. You know, it's going to be fine, but you know, you just start to get anxious. That's because that's a typical response um, that a lot of people have as they approach a vaccination or things. You don't have to have a phobia of needles to feel a little queasy when you're going to get something done, like an immunization or vaccination there. So that's also pretty normal, okay? Now, this is different. This column here, we're looking at our specific phobia responses. And you can see that these are a lot more dramatic 
these are a lot more um, impair, they cause a lot more impairment. And you can see the level of dysfunction. In each of these examples, the person's anxiety and stress actually leads them to experience dysfunction or not being able to function in their normal life. And we'll look, go through each example. One example now, not going to your best friend's island wedding because you'd have to fly there, okay? There's nothing there that's supposed to make you anxious. You're not even on the plane yet. There's no turbulence on the plane because you're not even on the plane. You're just sitting at home thinking about whether you want to go to your friend's wedding because you'd have to fly there. That would be a typical um, response, anxiety response shown by someone with a specific phobia of flying or specific phobia of heights, okay? And that is not normal. That is not typical and that is dysfunctional, okay? The next one, turning down a great job offer because it's on the 10th floor of the office building. Again, you've never even stepped foot onto the 10th floor of that office building. There's nothing there that's concrete or that's certain that's going to harm you, but you simply turn down that um, great job offer because of that premonition or because of that pr um, presumption that something bad's going to happen, okay, even before it does happen. So that is, again, another example of something that causes dysfunction and a kind of not normal um, anxiety response. Um, when we're talking about steering clear of the park because you might see a dog, okay? A lot of us might be scared of dogs, but let's say your friends want to meet in the park for a picnic after lockdown is over. If, if you don't have a specific phobia of dogs, you probably be like, okay, look, I'm kind of worried that there might be dogs there without a leash, but we'll see what happens or we'll try to move to an area where there's not a dog. A person with specific phobia though, who has a specific phobia of dogs, they might actually not even leave their house because they are so scared that they might see a dog at the park or that, you know, they might even see a dog that's like one kilometer away. That's enough for them to trigger that extreme fear response. Okay, no matter how what their friends say, no matter what their friends say about, oh, you know, if we see a dog, it's okay. We'll just quickly run back to the car. The person's not having it. The person's like, no, nah, no, nah, I can't do this. I've got a phobia of dogs. I can't, um, I can't take the risk. Okay, so even before you reach the park, even before the actual threat is there, the person's already started to show that extreme fear response then. And we call steering clear of the park avoidance behavior, okay? And a lot of people with specific phobia show avoidance behavior. Um, the last one is avoiding necessary medical treatments or doctor's checkups because you're scared of needles. So let's say, um, I know it's a really sad example, but let's say a person's almost whole family has passed away or has been in ICU because of COVID-19. And let's say that because this person has a specific phobia of needles, they're not getting the vaccination done. Even though everyone around them is telling them you've got to get it done, you know, you're at risk, blah, blah, blah. But they're not allowing themselves to get that done because they're scared of needles, because they have a phobia of needles, okay? That is, again, showing you some level of impairment there and some level of dysfunction, that even when the person knows that taking that COVID vaccine can help them to function better as a person and is better for their well-being, they don't take it because their anxiety overcomes their ability to look after their own well-being there, okay? So, again, that is an example of a not normal experience of anxiety and stress. Okay, you can see in all of those examples, the person on the, in the second column shows some level of impairment or dysfunction and how that anxiety affects their daily life. Okay, this is a really important characteristic of um, specific phobia and any mental disorder that it starts to affect your ability to go to your friend's wedding, to get a nice job, to go to the park and see your friends, or to even just look after your well being and your life. Okay, so these are really um, important examples to look at. And the thing is, when you get these in a scenario, um, the matter of the fact is that you're often looking for, whoops, I haven't let these people in. You're often looking for um, these kind of examples of dysfunction, okay? And if you can spot these levels of dysfunction, then it's most likely that the person in the scenario is experiencing specific phobia. Okay, so what is specific phobia? Let's define it. Look, all of us have an idea. Even before we started this chapter, all of us, when we saw the word phobia, we know what phobias basically are okay as a general knowledge without looking at the psych definition we know what they are in general okay we know that they are about fear we know that generally that fear tends to be quite intense we know that that fear can be irrational irrational means that sometimes that fear comes without reason it's like why would you be scared to leave the house like it's not like a seagull is going to come and you know sit on your head or you know bite your head off but the person to the person who's experiencing a specific phobia of birds or seagulls that's what the person thinks and a lot of the time we say it's uh, irrational because we say that the ways that they think about their specific phobia are simply illogical or unreasonable 
or you know don't have a proper reason there okay we say that the fear is intense because we say that that person experiences an extreme fear response okay it's a fear response that a person without a specific phobia doesn't show as much okay it's an extreme fear response it's a severe fear response okay we know specific phobia is a mental disorder and we know that the main symptom is anxiety because remember before we said specific phobia is an anxiety disorder okay and that anxiety is provoked whenever that whenever there's exposure or whenever there's a threat of that person being exposed to that specific phobic stimulus or specific feared stimulus there okay now this also leads a person to engage in avoidance behavior which we just mentioned on the previous slide avoidance behavior is when you go out of your way to prevent yourself uh, from being exposed or prevent encountering that phobic stimulus. So if I'm scared of that example with dogs, for example, if I'm scared of dogs or I have a specific phobia of dogs, I will um, not go to the park with my friends for a picnic because I'm so scared that a dog's going to be around. Or I might be like, okay, guys, let's just meet in my house because there's no way a dog can get into my house. Let's just have the picnic in my house. So I engage in that avoidance behavior that does affect my daily interactions and my daily functioning there. Okay, all of these this extreme fear response, this irrational thoughts, this anxiety, this avoidance behavior, in order to be officially diagnosed by a psychologist as having specific phobia needs to continue for six months. Okay, six months is the magic number there. All right. And like I said before, the phobic stimulus is simply the thing. So it could be an object, could be an event, could be a situation that causes that fear response. Okay, in the specific phobia of dogs, the phobic stimulus is dogs. In the specific phobia of um, long words the specific phobic stimulus is long words okay so that's the basic idea so you can see the difference between a normal fear okay and a phobia okay in normal fear it's usually caused by the threat of danger pain or harm and it's just an unpleasant emotion for most of uh, for most of us it usually passes after some time for phobia the um, effects are a lot more extreme a lot more irrational and the person actually becomes aversive to that particular thing even if they're even if you're let's say an aunt to maybe a nephew or niece and your nephew or niece comes up to you and says oh aunt look at this book that I got and the book has like a cartoon dog in it you're like ah get it away from me I don't want to see it because you're actually that scared of dogs and people with specific phobias aren't just scared of dogs like a specific phobia of dogs they're not just scared of dogs in real life they're scared of dogs on cartoons they're scared of dogs um, um, that are in the toy section of Kmart or Target, you know, those little plushy dogs. So all of those things are included as well. Okay, that's how we can differentiate a simple fear of dogs versus an actual specific phobia of dogs. Okay. All right, so these are some of the key features or characteristics of specific phobia. So remember, we, we went through some of these key characteristics, um, key features when we did um, sleep onset insomnia. We talked about what are the symptoms or what are the key features, what are the characteristics of that condition. So now we're going through some of the characteristics or key features of specific phobia. Okay, number one, we talked about the six months, okay, that the person experiences significant anxiety for six months. We talked about this idea that the fear is irrational or that it usually shouldn't deserve such a high fear response, but the person shows such an extreme fear response anyway. Okay, and sometimes it's without reason, it's out of the bounds of reason, it doesn't make sense. Um, the fear is very intense, so the person shows a very severe or a very extreme fear response there, okay, to the point where the person has to take big measures there to basically avoid the phobic stimulus and avoidance behavior was also one of those characteristics there. It leads to dysfunction because the person can't function in their normal life. Okay. One of the reasons they can't function is they keep showing those avoidance behaviors and avoidance behaviors also act as a perpetuating factor. If you remember from chapter four, uh, chapter 12, in the 4P model, a perpetuating factor is a factor that stops us from getting better. It's a factor that stops us from recovering and causes us to maintain our condition. So avoidance behavior is an example of a perpetuating factor there. 
Um, and the last thing is that we feel significant anxiety if we have specific phobia, even just when we think about the phobic stimulus. It doesn't even have to be direct confrontation or direct exposure to the phobic stimulus. Even just thinking about it gets us worked up or gets us to a high level of anxiety there. So, and that's, again, remember that anxiety is indicated by the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So I start thinking about dogs, my heart starts racing, you know, I start sweating. So it's actually a big... Um, a big kind of physiological response that's occurring there. And when we were doing uh, classical conditioning um, in unit three, I kept telling you guys that phobias are classically conditioned responses because you associate, there's a repeated association between the phobic stimulus which was originally neutral or originally produced no response, and then some kind of scary experience that you had associated with that phobic stimulus. Okay, no one is born with a phobia. People develop phobias or people are trained to get phobias, essentially. Okay, what that means is I wouldn't have been born with a phobia of, let's say, I don't know, example, dogs, but through some traumatic exposure to dogs, for example, through someone, through... Um, uh, being chased by a dog every day after school. And I think that was one of our scenarios in our past SAC. Um, through being chased by a dog every day after school, I have started to associate that extreme fear response I felt as I've run away from the dog with the side of the dog itself. So now every time I see another dog, it doesn't have to be the same dog, another dog on the street, I start to feel that same fear response. My heart starts racing, my palms start getting sweaty. Um, you know, my breathing becomes irregular, all that stuff starts to become apparent. And that's because fear responses or specific phobias are developed through the process of classical conditioning. Okay. Okay, so that's the basic um, idea. So from this uh, slide, guys, just know any um, three key features. Okay, any three, um, but just have an understanding of all of them. But for the SAC, you just need to memorize any three there. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's just comparing stress, anxiety, and specific phobia for you. So um, stress, again, you can see in all of those three, there's a similarity in the sense that we've got a similarity here, similarity here, similarity here. Whether you're experiencing stress, anxiety, or specific phobia, the sympathetic nervous system is always becoming dominant. And if you remember in unit three, we learned about the sympathetic nervous system as being responsible for our fight, flight, freeze response, Okay. And um, people who see their specific phobia, remember it's a threat. The specific phobic stimulus is a threat to that person. It's something they fear. So when they see that specific phobic stimulus, even in the distance, the fight, flight, freeze response starts to get activated there. Okay. Um, also, when we're looking at um, other kind of differences, we can talk about the idea that with stress, stress can be either you stress positive or distress negative, but in specific phobia, the feeling of fear is always predominant and it's always a negative feeling there. Okay, so that's the difference there. Um, some stress can be adaptive and help you to get work done. For example, the day before an assignment is due, you start to stress, but sometimes it gets you working and it gets your adrenaline pumping and gets you like, you know, motivated to do something. Some anxiety can also be adaptive as well. If we're not anxious about an upcoming oral presentation that we have to do, we might not actually motivate ourselves to get work done. So stress and anxiety in normal levels can be adaptive, but we say that the anxiety you feel and the stress you feel in phobia is maladaptive. We say that it doesn't help you to adapt because it leads to all those avoidance behaviors. Okay, and we know that normal stress and anxiety are not are not mental disorders in themselves, but they can contribute to the development or progression of one, but that specific phobia is an actual diagnosed mental health disorder, and we diagnose it using the different criteria we learned about on the previous slide. Okay, so that's just a summary of some key similarities and some key differences between um, stress, anxiety, and specific phobia there. Okay, so now we're moving on to 13b. And 13B looks at, okay, now we know what specific phobias are, we know how to define it, we know how, um, we know some of the kind of symptoms or characteristics we'd use to diagnose someone with specific phobia. Now let's look at how does a person actually gain specific phobia or develop specific phobia in the first place. And we're going to look at the biopsychosocial approach. So again, we are looking at the biological, um, psychological, and social factors here. Okay, so we're applying this biopsychosocial approach to understanding how these three factors combine to um, lead to the development of specific phobia.
Okay, so this is just an overview of um, the different factors that we're covering in this um, chapter. Okay, the first one, the first type of factors we're looking at are biological contributing factors, and we're starting with the role of GABA dysfunction. Okay, um, now from unit three, you should be able to remember that um, GABA is our red traffic light. Okay, we call it our red traffic light in the traffic light analogy because we say that it basically puts a stop to or kind of halts or kind of prevents um, proper neural activity and proper um, neural firing there. And what, what I mean by proper neural firing is it kind of puts a stop to excessive neural firing. So we say GABA increases the neural firing. And then if the neural firing of the brain gets too high, so there's way too much neural activity happening, this usually happens when we do things like overthink or learn too much, GABA comes in and kind of puts a uh, puts a decrease or puts kind of a little bit of a stop to that to reduce that excessive neural activity then remember it's not too good for our brains to become too active and too fired up okay because we do need to get to a point where we can relax where we can calm down because only then can we actually uh, de-stress only then can we actually relax and be able to go back to sleep again and be able to you know um, calm down okay so GABA is not our enemy GABA is actually important. It's an important new, um, neurotransmitter because it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, okay? And it basically regulates the activity of glutamate. Even though we say glutamate's good and glutamate does get a good rep because it helps us in learning and memory, um, too much glutamate can be a bad thing. Now, this is what people with specific phobia experience. Now, think about it this way, in a very simple way. If you've got a specific phobia of dogs, okay, you're always thinking about dogs. Even before you go to the supermarket, you're thinking about, oh my God, what if there's a dog on a leash that's been tied up outside the supermarket near the doors? What am I going to do? Blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of overthinking, okay? When you have a specific phobia of dogs, because you are so paranoid about the next time you might see a dog, the main kind of uh, characteristic of paranoia is overthinking, okay? You're repeatedly thinking about dogs all the time, about what you're going to do if you see a dog? How are you going to escape? Um, what's going to happen to your life after you get inevitably mauled by a dog on your way to Coles? Okay, all of these illogical and irrational thoughts start popping into your head. And one thought leads to another thought, leads to another thought, leads to another thought. And it just becomes an overthinking chaos. Okay, you're just overthinking so much. Every time you overthink, what happens is that glutamate starts to get released more and more, okay? Because every time you're overthinking, remember thinking is related to learning, it's related to memory. Every time you're overthinking, those excitatory neural transmissions are going up. There's a lot of neural firing occurring between the pre and post synaptic neurons in your brain, okay? And every time that happens, what's being released into the synaptic gap? It's glutamate. So you've got a lot of glutamate starting to build up in your brain, a lot of overexcitation and a lot of uncontrolled neural firing, okay? Neural firing meaning that those um, pre-synaptic sending neurons and post-synaptic receiving neurons are showing high, 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 extremely high levels of activity there, okay? It's extremely high, okay? And that's all due to the overthinking that the patient with the specific phobia goes through. Now, usually for most of us, what happens is that GABA comes in and GABA says, whoa, way too much overexcitation, way too much neural firing. We need to shut this thing down or we need to reduce this, okay? Because the brain is getting way too activated here and I can't calm down. The brain can't rest. The brain can't relax. So GABA comes in and does its thing. The issue with people who have specific phobia is that GABA does not function in the way that it normally does. And we actually experience or we see something called a GABA dysfunction, okay? Dysfunction meaning that GABA does not function in the way that it normally should. So that's the basic idea there, okay? Now, you can see in this diagram here that someone with a normal physiological state who doesn't have a mental disorder, you can see that there's an almost equal amount of the GABA marbles, which are represented in um, the kind of light transparent color, the white ones. And then you can see that they've got an almost equal number of glutamate neurotransmitters represented by those kind of black colored marbles there. Okay, so it's kind of equal and it's kind of balanced. Okay, balanced means that there's no dysfunction. Okay, this is like for someone who doesn't have specific phobia. Okay, so no dysfunction of GABA. Okay, my handwriting is really getting bad. 
Okay. Um, now, with people with anxiety disorders, so basically things like specific phobia, we see that there is an imbalance, okay? We see that there's more glutamate. We've got more of those black marbles there and very little GABA, okay? That's very little GABA. That very little GABA is what contributes to the GABA dysfunction. When you don't have enough GABA, GABA cannot work in the way that it normally can because it's not existing in the normal levels that it should be existing in the brain. So the glutamate here is weighing down all the overthinking, all that thing is causing a lot of excitation in the brain and a lot of glutamate is building up but there's not enough GABA to go back in there and to calm that down okay that's the basic idea so when there's not enough GABA okay or not enough neural transmission of GABA so GABA is not getting properly released into the synaptic gap or into the postsynaptic neuron there GABA dysfunction occurs and the patient's brain is basically unable to calm down Okay, and that's why people with specific phobias experience this constant feeling of not being able to go to sleep, of not being able to relax, of feeling on edge, okay, because there's so much overthinking and overexcitation that's occurring in their brain and simply not enough GABA to slow that overthinking down or to stop that overexcitation. Okay, that's the basic idea there. This is actually a really confusing um, topic, probably the most confusing factor for some of you. Um, just because it does get a bit biological, okay, and you do need to think about and look back to what GABA, what type of um, neurotransmitter GABA is, what effect it has on the postsynaptic neuron, and how GABA regulates the activity of glutamate. But if you've understood what I explained so far in this slide and it makes sense, um, then that's pretty much good. Okay, I've tried to explain it as simply as possible, um, and especially use this diagram. Um, with the marbles okay and showing you the imbalance because that really helps to visualize things better so that's the role of GABA dysfunction your book also gives a nice um, little diagram showing GABA as kind of like the sorry showing glutamate as kind of like the bad like angry looking neurotransmitters okay um kind of approaching the um neuron okay kind of approaching that postsynaptic neuron and showing that these um, kind of uh, culprits here are basically responsible for the overexcitation of the brain, okay? And that over time, that's what leads to patients with specific phobia showing high levels of anxiety, showing this inability to calm down because they've just their brain is just so overexcited. And overexcited doesn't mean overexcited, like, yeah, I'm so overexcited. It means overexcited due to the excessive excitatory activity that these neurotransmitters have caused. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Okay, when we're talking about the role of the stress response, what we're looking at um, is we're looking at this idea of, um, you know, when we are experiencing specific phobia, we generally experience um, a stress response. Okay, like I said in the previous slide, when we experience, when a person experiences specific phobia, they show a fight, flight, freeze response. Okay, so the minute they see their specific phobia, even if it's in the distance, even if they're from, you know, looking at it from some height there, they experience the phobic response there. Okay, and that phobic response often involves them either fighting the um, phobic stimulus, which is actually quite rare because people with specific phobia are too scared to do that. Okay. It involves them uh, freezing on the spot. So showing a freeze response where they just stand still and they can't move or showing a flight response, which basically means that they run away from it. Okay. And this is the most common response that people with specific phobia show. They try their best to run away from it. Usually people with specific phobia don't allow themselves to get into situations where they will, um, encounter the phobic stimulus again because they use avoidance behavior so there's no way that they can see a dog at the park if they don't go to the park to begin with that's the idea that kind of runs through their head okay remember that when we talk about the stress response that stress response that people experience in specific phobia is due to the activation of the sympathetic nervous system okay and um involves the whole autonomic nervous system as well, because after the uh, phobic stimulus has passed, obviously the parasympathetic will kick in. Okay, um, the role of the stress response is a biological factor because phobic anxiety responses lead to changes. So remember when the sympathetic nervous system gets activated, when we're stressed or anxious, it leads to changes in physiological functioning. So for example, this girl will experience things like increased heart rate. Okay, she'll experience um, increased perspiration or increased sweating. She'll experience an irregular um, breathing rate. Okay. All of these things will start to happen. Her pupils will start to dilate. All of these are biological or psychological kind of changes there. 
Okay. And when you experience these changes, it actually starts to worsen the anxiety that you feel as you're looking at a spider and your heart starts racing, you feel this level of physical discomfort and you start to associate that with the phobic stimulus that, oh my God, every time I see a dog, my heart's going to start beating again. Um, my heart's going to start racing again, sorry. And I'm going to feel really bad. So I'd just rather stay at home and not put myself through that. Okay. That's the, that's the basic idea. And remember that when people experience these symptoms, they often feel unbearable and they feel debilitating. They feel like they're breaking the person down. So generally avoidance behavior is shown in order to avoid or prevent experiencing these debilitating physiological symptoms or effects there. Okay. And the next thing is the role of LTP. Now, LTP is similar to the GABA dysfunction aspect. Okay. It's a bit more biological, but um, nothing that we haven't learned before. Look, when we learned about long-term potentiation in unit three, we basically learned that it is um, about the strengthening of neural connections, that the more you go through something, the more you learn something or revise something or think about something, the more likely it is that there's going to be a strengthening of the synaptic connections. And that is experience dependent because it's dependent on how much you revise or how much you think about something. Okay, so that's the basic um, idea there. That there's a strengthening of those synaptic connections. Now, LTP plays a role because when we talk about the way the person thinks about their phobic stimulus, they're thinking about their phobic stimulus all the time okay each time they think about the phobic stimulus what they're really doing in a way is they're revising their knowledge of the phobic stimulus okay they're relearning it again they're going through it again okay the more you think about something the better it sticks into your memory so the more the person with specific phobia thinks about the phobic stimulus okay the more likely they are to remember that okay um, in the future and the more difficult it becomes for them to forget any of the traumatic memories associated with that phobic stimulus. So this guy may never really forget being chased down the dog, uh, sorry, chased down, the, chased down the road by a dog as he was trying to deliver some mail, okay? That's a memory that's going to stick with him because it's a memory that was emotionally charged, okay? Um, so we can link this to the consolidation of emotionally arousing experiences as well that we've learned about before. The other reason, and this is probably the more confusing reason, is related to the co-activation of neural pathways. When we think about, and remember, neural pathways just like a chain of um, neural connections or a chain of synaptic connections that kind of are combined with one another, okay, to make a big pathway there. So when we think about a spider or when we judge or perceive a spider in our environment, there's one neural pathway that, that gets connected or that gets activated or lights up because of that. That's the pink one, okay? So you can see the pink one here. And then you can see the neural pathway that activates the fear response is another neural pathway. It's the green one. Over time, whenever you see the spider and you feel the fear, those are two separate neural connections or neural pathways, okay, that represent those experiences. But over time, what happens is when you're constantly seeing the spider and then feeling the fear response, seeing the spider, feeling the fear response, eventually what happens is that there becomes a co-activation. So what was, what was initially two separate um, neural pathways representing two separate events now kind of combine to form one co-activated neural pathway there. So you can see that they've kind of overlapped in this section here, okay? That's because of the repeated co-activation of those neural pathways that led those two separate neural pathways to become one, okay? And this is when it becomes all the more difficult for us to actually undo that association, for us to undo that kind of co-activation there that's occurred. Now, every time we see or perceive the phobic stimulus, the fear response is almost immediate. It's almost automatic, okay? And we don't forget to show that fear response as well because that fear response is strengthened or consolidated, okay? So whenever the person is in the presence of a dog again, it just like a light switch, like turning on a light switch, that fear response gets turned on as well. Okay. And that fear response kind of lights up. So that's the basic idea. Just remember there's two separate neural pathways initially, but a person with phobic, uh, with a phobic, uh, with a specific phobia, those two neural pathways become one. Okay. So that's the basic idea. Okay. Also, you might remember the saying neurons that fire together, wire together. So it's the same concept that's demonstrated here. Because those two neural pathways are constantly firing together, for example, seeing the spider and then feeling the fear response, um, those two are constantly firing together. So eventually they wire together. They form the one neural pathway going from two to one. 
Okay, so that's basically what the role of long-term potentiation is. Um, now we're looking at the psychological contributing factors. So the first one is precipitation by classical conditioning. This is literally what I kind of explained in the last spread, just looking at how um, specific phobias are developed. Okay, just remember that precipitation by classical conditioning means how a classical, sorry, how a specific phobia is developed. Okay, that's the basic idea. Or how are they established? Um, so this is the process. Okay, usually we've got a neutral stimulus that doesn't produce a response like the white rat in Little Albert Experiment, for example. In Little Albert Experiment, the white rat was continuously or repeatedly paired with um, you know, a loud noise, okay? That loud noise was the striking of the hammer behind Little Albert's head, okay, which made a really loud noise. So the loud noise and the white rat are repeatedly paired with one another to produce a fear response. And what happens is that baby eventually started to associate not the loud noise, but the white rat with its fear response. And that white rat or that CS became the phobic stimulus. In any scenario um, on classical conditioning that we've done related to fear, the CS or the condition stimulus has always been the phobic stimulus. They are equal to each other. They are one and the same, okay? The phobic stimulus is the condition stimulus and the conditioned response is basically the phobic fear response. That's the extreme fear response that we see, okay? So that's, the, um, that's how we're linking terminology from this chapter to the previous chapter. So that's basically how um, classical conditioning processes can be used through this process of repeated association between an initially neutral stimulus and something that normally causes fear or uh, frightens the child and how that can then repeatedly associate with one another to uh, lead to the development of that phobia there. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Um, okay. So then we've got perpetuation by operant conditioning. So we, you see that we're referring to both of those learning models that we learned about earlier in unit three, classical conditioning and operant conditioning. And that's why these two factors actually fall under the psychological contributing factors because classical conditioning and operant conditioning are both examples of learning models and they fall under the psychological criteria. So after acquisition of a phobia or after the person has developed the phobia or established the phobia, what happens is the phobia is maintained, okay? And the phobia is maintained or perpetuated. Remember we said avoidance behavior is a perpetuating factor because it maintains a person's condition and prevents their recovery. Um, avoidance behavior is one of the main reasons why people with phobias continue to have phobias, why they can't recover. Okay, so if, for example, a boy is scared of spiders, he might avoid the spider, okay, and this might give him relief or pleasant feelings. And basically, if you remember all the different types of reinforcement that we learned about in, in unit three with operating conditioning, this actually acts as negative reinforcement. So that avoidance behavior allows the boy to experience relief because he's taken away the fear or taken away the prospect of seeing the spider. And so that negatively reinforces his avoidance behavior. So in the future, there's an increased likelihood that he'll be inclined or motivated to avoid spiders again. Okay, so the future likelihood of avoidance behavior occurring again in the future is increased. And that's because avoidance behavior leads to negative reinforcement, which is taking away something that's usually unpleasant, which brings feelings of relief. Okay, um, so that's really important for us to remember that avoidance behavior isn't just something the person does because it makes them, you know, it makes them um, happy. It's something that they do because it brings them relief and that we can link this back to negative reinforcement as well. Okay, so that's how we link perpetuation by operant conditioning. Perpetuation simply means maintenance of the specific phobia as a result of operant conditioning. So you need to be able to know that it's always negative reinforcement that's directly linked to the avoidance behavior there. Okay. This is just an example, or this diagram here is just an example showing you guys how classical conditioning is kind of step one to forming the phobia. So this is for initial development, okay, in the beginning stages, and how step two is operant conditioning. So this is how we now maintain. So we already developed the phobia, now how are we going to maintain it over time, or how are we going to make sure that we don't uh, recover from it, okay? Um, and that's because of the negative reinforcement there that we talked about, okay, as a result of the avoidance behavior. So that is um, perpetuation by operant conditioning. 
these are this is slide just shows you guys um, a summary of the two. So look, if you if you're not going to learn anything, at least learn this little box here. If you're not going to learn anything from the previous two slides, or you are quickly revising before the stack and you don't want to go through the previous two slides, just learn this. Okay, the specific phobias are established or developed through classical conditioning processes, and the specific phobias are then maintained or modified or perpetuated through operant conditioning processes. Okay, now even though sometimes we only look at negative reinforcement as, as being associated with the maintenance of a specific phobia. We can also look at positive reinforcement as well, but we don't, it's not really something in the book. However, it's probably good to mention something like if a child, for example, has a specific phobia of birds, but then the mum says, oh, come to the park, come to the park. We're going to, um, you know, even if we see birds, it's okay, you'll be fine. I'll give you a lollipop if you come to the park um, and don't show a phobic response. And if the child actually agrees to sell their well-being for a lollipop and come to the park, um, that's kind of positive reinforcement there. That's caused them to overcome that avoidance behavior because they were coaxed by a lollipop, okay, which is an example of a reward. Um, again, generally, we don't kind of, talk too much about positive reinforcement. We talk more about the negative reinforcement as a result of the avoidance behavior, but just something to also keep at the back of your head, okay, in case you do get a scenario on that in the exam. Okay, but as per the study design, it's not something that they focus on too much. All right, with cognitive biases, this is our other type of psychological factor. So I think we already looked at cognitive biases with reference to the general development of mental disorders in the last chapter. It's also really important to think about cognitive bias as a as a result of um, as a result of specific phobia. Okay, people who have specific phobias tend to think about and process information about their specific phobic stimulus in a very faulty way, in a skewed way, in a way that's not really balanced. Okay, and this leads them to make errors in their judgments and errors in their thoughts about the phobic stimulus. Okay, so for example, if you looked at this. At a glance, you looked at this picture. If you had a specific phobia of spiders or you're generally a bit uneasy about spiders, you might have thought that looked like a spider, okay? Even though that's just some lemurs that are sharing a meal, okay? But to you, because you make errors in your judgments about that phobic stimulus, that looks like something else. It's kind of similar to like, if there's a piece of thread on the floor, okay? And you're on the other side of the class and you've got a specific phobia of spiders, you might be like, oh my God, there's a spider on the other side of the class, but actually it's just like a piece of thread or a piece of um, string or something like that, okay? So cognitive bias is the errors in judgment that we make about our phobic stimulus. There's two types of uh, cognitive bias that you need to know. The first one is memory bias. Memory bias is this idea that we remember the negative or the threatening or the bad memories of our specific phobia a lot better than we remember the good information or the neutral information. So if someone's scared of going to the dentist, they only ever recall the one painful dental checkup they had where the dentist used the drill and they forget about all the other frightening or painless checkups that they had where they weren't in pain or they weren't feeling discomfort, okay? Another example could be if you're scared of birds, um, the person with the specific phobia of birds only remembers the one time that they were pecked by a seagull at the beach, but don't remember all the other times they went to the park or the beach where birds never attacked them. So it's kind of like you're biased in terms of how you recall memories about the phobic stimulus. Catastrophic thinking is what the name suggests. So you think of everything as being kind of like a catastrophe, okay? It's the worst possible scenario that could occur, okay? It's the tendency for us to perceive a phobic stimulus as being far more threatening, dangerous, or insufferable than, than it actually is. And that if you ever were to encounter that phobic stimulus, well, that's it. That's the end of me kind of situation. Okay. The worst possible scenario, things are going to be catastrophic. It's going to be a catastrophe. So a person with a phobia of bees might think that if they have any encounter with bees, that the bees will kill them. Okay, for example, a person with a phobia of birds might think, oh my God, if I go to a beach, a seagull is going to peck my head off and peck my brains. Okay, it's exaggerated, but that's how these, um, that's how people with specific phobia sometimes may think, okay, because they are prone to these cognitive biases there. Okay, so that's just, just know each of these definitions, doesn't have to be word to word, but just focus on the bolded information in the definition. And also just know one example for each. So you got one on the slide, if you want to make up your own example, that's more relevant um, to what you've seen on a show or something or on a movie or what you are more interested in, in terms of phobias, um, you can just make up your own example there. Okay, and the last thing we're going through for today 
um, our, our social contributing factors. So our social contributing factors are basically of two types. The first one is specific environmental triggers. Now, a trigger is basically something that sets you off. It sets off a particular response to occur. So specific environmental triggers are specific stimuli or experiences that a person goes through in their environment. Okay, and that's why we call specific uh, environmental triggers a social factor, okay, because usually we experience these triggers in our social environment. Okay, when we experience these um, specific environmental triggers, they basically prompt a fear response. And depending on how traumatic or how intense that fear response is to begin with, um, that can lead to us contributing to the development of a specific phobia. Okay, there are three main ways in which specific triggers can actually work. The first one is that you as a person can directly confront or be confronted by a traumatic stimulus. So if you're swimming in the ocean um, and, you know, a shark chases you, that is an example of the first one about direct confrontation there. Okay, and this man, because of his direct confrontation with the shark and almost being eaten alive by a shark, he might develop a phobia of sharks because of that. He's directly experienced that uh, situation himself. We can also um, experience or develop a specific phobia through observing somebody else having a direct confrontation. So let's say it's not you going through this, but let's say it's someone else. Okay, so for example, you're part of a scuba diving team and you see one of your scuba diving team members um, being chased by a shark. Okay, you can see that through the, I don't know, through the camera that kind of feeds back to the boat or something. You're on the boat, you can see through their GoPro or whatever that they're being chased by a shark. Okay, that's not you experiencing that yourself, but you've observed someone else experiencing that. And as a result of that, that might affect you to the extent that you could develop a specific phobia out of that experience, okay? Um, this is vicarious conditioning. If you remember, vicarious reinforcement and vicarious punishment can be linked to observational learning in unit three, okay? Generally, when we see someone experiencing a negative situation or something negative like a punishment, like being chased by a shark or bitten by a shark, we are less likely to engage in that behavior ourselves. So this person who's viewed their scuba diving team member um, being chased by a shark might tell themselves, oh my God, this is the last time I'm ever going scuba diving, okay, because they associate those two events. The last way that we learn about, the last way that people can develop phobias and a really interesting one is through indirect learning about that dangerous or traumatic stimulus through movies, through TV series, through the media, okay. Um, a lot of people developed a phobia of sharks after watching Jaws, Okay, which was a movie that came out ages ago, but it was kind of one of the first mainstream movies about killer sharks, basically. Um, and a lot of people after watching this movie and seeing the experiences of the people in the movie, even though it was a fictitious movie, it's not based on real life, um, actually experienced a phobic response that led to the development of the specific phobia. And a lot of these people avoided beaches and avoided ocean areas for a long time after they watched the movie. Okay, a similar uh, recent example was the movie with um, Blake Lively in it. I think it was called The Shallows. Okay, that was also a movie about a killer shark. And there have been so many different shark, killer shark movies since then. Okay, so the main idea is we can learn to fear something as a result of seeing it on a movie or TV. Another really common example is with the killer clowns and the It movie, okay? Um, a lot of people developed a phobia of clowns after watching the It movie, whether it was the recent one or whether it was the one that was released a few decades back. Um, that movie was very traumatic for some people, okay? Now, how can we avoid the effect of specific environmental triggers? We can either try to look at more positive media, okay? There's not a lot of positive media about sharks, but there's apparently a book called Charlie the Friendly Shark. So if you've got a kid who's scared of sharks, um, you don't want to teach them that sharks love people, but you want to teach them that, you know what, maybe sharks are not as, um, you know, scary as you think to the extent that you don't need to avoid coming to the beach because you think a shark's going to jump onto the sand and eat you alive. It's not going to happen, okay? So just trying to make them see that they're being a little bit irrational or that they're being a little bit exaggerated in their thoughts there, okay, which is what we actually do see in people with specific phobias. Alrighty, so the last thing we're looking at today, something we've covered um, before as well, and it's about stigma, okay. Generally, people who have a specific phobia are accused of being, um, ex of being kind of like dramatic, okay. They're accused of exaggerating 
they're accused of being weak or because they've got a specific phobia. And look, it depends if you're, especially it depends on who you are as well. It depends on the culture you come from. It depends on your gender. But um, stigma is something that affects everyone who has a mental disorder and specific people with specific phobia um, often feel ashamed. Okay. They feel ashamed to seek treatment. They feel hesitant to seek treatment. A lot of people don't believe in specific phobias. In fact, specific phobias are not taken seriously, probably even less seriously than depression is. Okay. Because a lot of people can't distinguish between normal fear and the fear that a person with specific phobia experiences, which as we know, and as we learned at the beginning of the chapter are two different things, okay? So the main idea to take from this slide is that stigma that surrounds seeking treatment can stop people with specific phobia from receiving the help and support that they need. Particularly if they need medication, they can't have that medication on time. Over time, when you're delaying your treatment, what that does is it actually exacerbates or actually worsens um, your condition and it worsens those anxiety symptoms that you're experiencing simply because you can't uh, get the treatment that you need and you can't get it at the right time because you're scared that society is judging you and because stigma is very influenced by what society thinks that's why stigma around seeking treatment becomes a social contributing factor okay so that's the basic um, idea then okay um I believe that that's the, there, that's the last spread. This table is from our old textbook that we used to have. I've just put it in here because I think it's a good way to link back some of the four P factors to the um, factors that we've looked at in this chapter. Okay, just for your knowledge, it's good to be able to link different topics together there. So have a look at this. We've gone through some of them already, but just have a look at this. We haven't covered any of the protective factors yet. We're gonna be covering this in the next spread. Okay, so don't worry about the last row of protective factors here, but the first three we have learned today. Alrighty, so that's it for today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording here.